Buongiorno a tutti. Bonjour. Good morning, everyone. Well, uh, thank you very much for being here today for the official press conference of World Shira 2025. Uh, this is the official launch we wanted to make here at AIMA. So I'm glad to be here today. Uh, I'm Gwendolyn Legrand, co-director of uh, GoFor Association. That is the organization uh, setting up everything about FIRA events. So the ninth edition of World FIRA will take place in February from the 4th to the 6th, 2025, uh, near Toulouse in the south of France. Uh, so this year we wanted to really point out that this is the international field exhibition of agricultural robotics. This is the only event dedicated to agricultural robotics in the world that take place in Toulouse since 2016 and also since 2022 in the US in California. I hope you enjoyed this uh, teaser. Uh, that is the, well, that's it, the 2024 images that we, we brought from uh, the last edition. Uh, this year, we really want to position World Fira 2025 as robotic innovations addressing the global agricultural challenges. I want to report on the OECD 2023 report, on which it's very clear that, of course, agriculture faces dual challenge increasing production volumes and labor productivity to ensure food security while minimizing environmental impacts. So the sector is also struggling with recruitment with difficulties. We all know about that. And we really think that agricultural robots and autonomous systems are emerging as critical solutions. World Fira 2025 serves as the premier platform for exploring and adopting these technologies. So, World FIRA is the global event for agricultural robots in action. I want to take some key figures. World FIRA is a very qualified event dedicated to the agricultural robotics industry. We have made the history uh, since 2016 when we've launched the first edition of FIRA. Now, over 3,000 visitors from 44 around 40 to 50 countries are visiting the events and we have more than 40 robots in the fields that are showcasing and demoing. I will come back to this later. So we have those four field demonstration zones on 2.5 hectares. That is a real field, I want to insist on that. The robots are in action in real conditions, making demo in the soil, making sure that people can see what the robots and the autonomous systems are really doing. And we have different types of uh, crops that are set up during the events. So for field crops, for vegetables, for vines, and for, for trees. This is the story I wanted to tell you today about the crops that just started to be seeded and transplanted early this week. So you can see that this is the field, this is the real field, with the small crops that are already growing with the spinach and the faba beans that you can see here. You can also see the map of uh, all the crops and all the fields with a very, very large area to make sure that you can see all the robots in action during the three days. I want to point out also that we have a very precise schedule of demo every day. So we make sure that every manufacturer has a time slot to present with the mic what the machine is doing. 
This is how we've made the crops this year. Of course, it has been seeded and transplanted manually. For some of them, we can see Marie Flor, who is doing uh, the nice job for the GMO, who is transplanted right now the, the spinach. But, and this is brand new, and this is what the future is now, is that we've been using robots for seeding this year for the first time. So I want to show you some images of the faba bean seeding by Softy Rob, which is a French manufacturer that did this. It was on Monday, I think, actually. We just got these images. Yeah, it was on Monday. So nice, nice job. Softy Rob is a nice story because it's an agricultural, it's a farmer who actually developed with his son this machine because he needed something autonomous. And the help also of Nayo Technologies with Oreo, and there was also Oz that was seeding radish on Monday for the, for the event. Now let's go a little bit uh, more deeply, let's say, in the content of FIRA. So we have time for conviviality also because we know that farmers appreciate to see machines, but they also appreciate and everyone appreciates to have some time to discuss. So we have this nice refreshment with the young farmers of the, of the local association that is bringing some refreshments. We have also sometimes with meetings between farmers, users, non-users, that are discussing their needs, their feedbacks as users, and how they can also, let's say, support the industry. And we have this Genget party. I don't know if there are French people around the area, what Genget is, but it's very French party. The time for knowledge. This is a big point about FIRA, because FIRA is not a trade show like all the other ones. We have a very, very strong and powerful content. Uh, and I want to point out like four of them. So the sixth scientific symposium that is highlighting the, research, the project research uh, that are coming from different labs, universities from all over, all over the world, that is organized by INRAI and Robagri Association. The second Agrobotics Autonomy Symposium, this is really about regulation, how the standardization would be possible and safety. We are organizing this second symposium with Federuna Coma and Axema. Um, there are also the 10 pitch session. We are coming back from FIRA USA 10 days ago, actually, and we have experienced this new format of sessions during which we have farmers, specific crops associations that are taking the stage and presenting the needs of a very specific industry in terms of automation. So that's very interesting because they are pointing out what they need and the gap of what is actually the answer of the manufacturers. So it's very interesting to see that, of course, there are still some gaps to be filled. And uh, after those kind of sessions, it's um, a good collaboration between the manufacturers and the farmers. And finally, the Grand Défi Robotic Agricole with collaborative workshops that helps to understand what are the feelings of the farmers about automation, what they really think about it, how they would adopt it, how they would not adopt it. And we like this kind of controversies that make sense when you have this kind of disruptive innovation as robotics is. Let's go now for the World Fira Awards 2025. Just for you to know that we have now four categories that will be rewarded during the event. The Agrobot of the Year, that is the farmer's choice coming from the Future Farming Robotic Guide. The Best Startup, this is the investor's choice. We have a pitch session uh, from startups that have been shortlisted in front of investors, and we award uh, the best startup of the year. The best World Fira robots, 
I think this one is very interesting too because this comes from the votes of the participants. So it's something completely different. People can see the robots uh, demoing, showcasing, and then they vote for their favorite one. And the Akaton Award, that is more the scientist, scientist choice, coming from Robagri and organized by Robagri Association. Some highlights this year. International pavilions are taking more and more place at World Fiera. Comes from embassy, it comes from associations. Uh, we have, for example, the Dutch pavilion that is coming back this year with startups, uh, innovative startups coming uh, from uh, Netherlands, and uh, the Fundao Portugal pavilion that is also presenting the global ecosystem of the region. I also want to, <coughs> sorry, to thank and to welcome New Holland on board this year again. Uh, they chose FIRA, and I will let the, the word to Mary Montu on just afterwards. Uh, World FIRA as gold partner to present their cutting edge solutions, enhancing efficiency, productivity, and sustainability in farming. And finally, the calls that we are making at World FIRA, there are two different calls that are officially open today. There is the call for pitch that will uh, reward the startups, as I mentioned earlier, and the call for papers for the research project of the scientific symposium. This is the end of my presentation. This is not the end of the press conference because then we will have this nice panel discussion. Uh, now I'm open to questions if you have any. One of the things that have been keeping robotics down at, in the United States are regulations about needing to have an operator within line of sight. Have you heard anything about that changing anytime soon? Or are there similar regulations in other countries? Oh, it's working? Yeah, oh. Thank you for the question. Very, very important one. Well, actually, the thing is, in California, and I think that even Matthias could answer afterwards about that, sure, it's not possible yet, but things are moving and uh, we are very happy with FIRA that we are bringing uh, the government at the event for them to really maybe discover, understand what the industry is, what farmers are needing. And uh, for example, in the, in the US 10 days ago, we had this board of uh, the Ministry of Agriculture of California that were there. And uh, we had also the um, visit of Kalosha. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with them. And this is very important for us to make sure that they are there and they are now rethinking things. So I cannot talk uh, for them, but I'm sure that things are moving. And well, it's moving, I think, fast enough. Well said. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question? Perfect, thank you. Are there any French journalists in the room? No? Okay. We are live streamed, just for you to know. And uh, now, I am very, very pleased to welcome on stage three of our main partners at World Fira, but not only partners, they are ma major players in the ag robotics industry. So I'm very pleased to welcome on stage Marie Mouton from New Holland CNH, <laughs> Jess Pedersen from AgroIntelli, and Matthias Carrier from Nayo Technologies. Please have a seat. So this roundtable is really to understand their vision about automation in the fields, what they think about robotics in the fields, and how they see from their point of view automation coming to farms. Well, 
maybe I will uh, let you introduce yourself first. So, Marie, please. Uh, ladies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me, first of all. So, I'm uh, Marie Mouton. I'm responsible for global communications for the brand New Holland uh, from the group CNH. Jess? Uh, I'm Jess Peterson from Agro Intelli. We are a Danish manufacturer of uh, an autonomous uh, tool carrier called Roboti. And I'm based in uh, the south of Germany. Uh, and I've been in the business for special uh, ag uh, 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 vehicles and special ag, uh, agriculture machinery for the last 35 years and uh, the last four years for uh, Roboti. Matthias. Hi everyone, thank you, uh, Gwendolyn. So I'm the sales director at Neo Technology um, and I, um, I am in the agrobot market since more than 10 years right now. And it's a pleasure to, to be here as we contribute a few years ago to launch the FIRA event. So it's nice to be here. And, for the next edition. Thank you, everyone. Well, let's start with uh, Mary. I wanted to have you on stage because, of course, New Holland is a major OEM, and I wanted to get your, your vision on how automation is evolving and what ways has it already begun to take shape, actually? Yes, so, I mean, I speak on behalf of New Holland, of course, so we see really uh, the evolution of automation as a very significant and, and very fast-moving for uh, the farming. And uh, as an OEM, uh, we, we understand that we have to solve several problematics and that automation will support solving those problematics. So the first one, I think everyone in the industry is aware, the, the bottom line for farmers is the, is the most important thing. So we need to help them be more productive, to increase their yield, to manage better their resources. And this is where this technology can help us. Uh, by the way, we already integrate some of those technology in our uh, tractors, in our machines. Uh, someone talked about regulations before. This is clearly uh, an element on the, on the environment that is um, preventing us to move at the speed we would like to. But technologically speaking, we are already there. Then the other uh, problematic we have to solve, it's not maybe the case in Europe, but in some areas in the world, we have uh, some uh, labor shortage issues or you have uh, maybe operators that do not have the same experience that we would need. So here, automation and technology is absolutely key so that uh, the operator is not a merely driver, that is more a supervisor. And then the last point, always in the optic of, um, of having uh, more productivity, is to use uh, connectivity, connected services, to make the most out, out of the season, to make sure we can do remote maintenance, to have uh, the machine up and running in the field, in particular where we have short harvesting windows. So all of that to say that this is absolutely important. We cannot anymore think about uh, ag machinery as a only iron manufacturer. We, we need to think in terms of solutions, uh, integrating fully the technology and being easy to use, easy to understand, for all of the farmers, whatever is their advancement in terms of uh, understanding of technology. So we try to work in this direction. Very interesting. Thank you, Mary. I'm turning to Matthias from Nio Technologies. We all all very often say that Nio Technologies is the pioneer of agrobotics in the world. So I would ask you, how did you see the evolution since the beginning of OZ back in 2013, I think? Yeah, you're right. The first unit uh, been in the hand of a farmer uh, in the uh, end of uh, 2013. And um, clearly, when we come to the ag market, it was an uh, uncharted territory for us. Uh, we come with um, a machine we is clearly out of the box regarding the, the ag machinery. It's not a tractor. It was a tiny machine for little uh, vegetable growers. And... Um, Clearly, uh, in 10 years, we've seen the technology evolution, but also um, the global interest on the market. I remember the first demos. People were thinking that the robots will work, clearly, but the, they were always looking behind the robots about the tools who will work, the job done by the tools, and not the guidance of the machine. And it, 
we've seen step by step the robots uh, evolving in the same time uh, of the, the mindset of the farmers. And now we are clearly uh, not speaking about uh, a one task robot like at the early beginning, Oz was a weeder, uh, autonomous weeder. Now it's an autonomous platform and it can make several tasks for the farmer. And this is a big change. And most of the company are starting with one task and now they are providing more global solution. And uh, this is one of the big change we faced. And now skepticism, it was 10 years ago and now it's more reality. And there is users in, uh, of robots worldwide. So it's become a real market and a real solution and answer for farmers. And now you have a, a range of four robots, right? Yeah, we have a range of four robots. Uh, we are not only in the uh, market gardener market. Uh, we are covering all the specialized crops from the vineyard with two robots for uh, classic uh, vineyards and narrow alley uh, vineyards. And also um, the big one you've seen uh, for, uh, for the, um, the big growers, vegetable growers, the one who uh, was seeding uh, the crops for uh, the next uh, World Fair show. Okay, thank you very much. I'm turning also to Jess from Agro Intelli, uh, regarding also your, from almost the beginning of the history of agrobotics uh, uh, in activity. So since you began in agricultural robotics, what are the most significant impacts you've observed on farms using your solutions? Well, well eight, ten years ago, uh, when all this robotics started, where you were there, uh, we were thinking that uh, the farmers, they will be driven by uh, sustainability, biodiversity, and all that that will bring also the robotic and the automatization uh, forward. But now we see that uh, actually what's driven is the lack of labor. It's, uh, it's also the willingness to do this this work in in agriculture, so actually the, the 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 customers we have now that is the the one who uh, wants to buy a robotic for seeding and for weeding because they cannot get the qualified work in the field, and when uh, the farmer first get a robotic, then he actually start also using the machine for other purposes than, uh, than he actually, uh, than he actually uh, was supposed to do. So he starts fertilizing, he starts, yeah, whatever you can imagine in the field. All right, yeah, you, you're mentioning labor and uh, we can feel that sometimes in Europe people are m sometimes afraid about robots taking jobs. So I want to ask this question that is sometimes tricky, but I've heard so many nice stories that it's not taking, but making jobs because actually farmers are having more time to make valuable tasks. And uh, wh what is your point of view? And I'm turning to all the three of you, if you have uh, an answer to that. Uh, the robot is not taking work away, but it's making more time for the farmers. That's exactly what we've heard. I have this story from the US, a US farmer that he's processing and growing tomatoes that he used to manually harvest uh, two tons per year. And after having this autonomous translator, he could make 11 tons per year. So he said, I am making value jobs actually. So I think that's very nice story. And well, and that's what about World Fira too. We want farmers on stage to really give them their feedback and maybe erase some ideas of fantasy that we can have about sometimes automation and robotics. Uh, Matthias, we've heard a lot about the augmented autonomy you've released so far. Can you please tell us more about this? Yes, thank you, uh, Gwendolyn. Uh, there was a question about regulation. And uh, I think uh, when you look all the robots on film, they are all autonomous regarding the tasks they are doing. But we need to have uh, human supervision. and. We work since several years on this topic to avoid human supervision at NIO Technologies. And that's why we developed this uh, auto um, augmented autonomy in order to, to say that our machine can do a, a job on field and the supervisor is not mandatory around the field. And why we run this topic like that? Just regarding um, what um, 
uh, ag robots manufacturer needs to do. He needs to ensure that the machine don't leave the plot, and obviously the machine don't hurt someone on the field. And each manufacturer has to provide his own risk analysis regarding the characteristic of the machine and the use case. For example, the use case of our little robot hose 150 kilos in a, a market gardener with two hectares of vegetable, and our TED two tons, five kilometers per hour in a vineyard, the safety need to be quite different. And that's why there is several solutions, several options for all the manufacturers. And at NIO, we decided to ensure that thanks to uh, uh, the um, geofencing and uh, an audit and analysis of uh, the plot of the farmer, we can ensure that the robot won't leave the plot. Then we provide the safety regarding the characteristic of the machine and the use case. And thanks to that, we can ensure that the robot will stop if there is a human obstacle. And thanks to that, we can allow the farmer to go to another place, for example, to be on his tractor in another plot and let the robot do his task. And this is really important. Each manufacturer has to define his own solution. We will see a change next year because uh, a directive, a kind of agrobot directive will come in 2025 and will give more answer regarding uh, those topic and uh, a clear rest situation. Thank you, Matthias. If you have any question afterwards about this, we can uh, also take some. Uh, just this is a kind of breaking news, I would say, that a few days ago, Kubota announced a partnership with Agro Intelli. So I wanted to learn more about these partnerships and how it will maybe contribute to the evolution of Agro Intelli. Yes, it's true that we have been uh, uh, signing a commercial distribution uh, contract with, uh, with Kubota. And in this context, it also includes uh, a branded Kubota, uh, like a branded uh, robot made for Kubota. And uh, we uh, will announce more of this, uh, this agreement uh, later this year. But for sure, it's a, it's a big uh, validation of, uh, of uh, Ruboti as a, as a platform. And uh, it also says a little bit about the reliability of Ruboti uh, nowadays. Is it an exclusive uh, partnership uh, in terms of dealership? Or how is it going to be? Mm, it's a commercial uh, partnership. All right, perfect. Thank you and very much. There will be more following uh, later this year. Yeah, and you will be there. I will if you're at That's Stellas. all I know. In February, of course. Um, regarding partnerships, New Holland has established very strong partnerships with, let's say, startups, companies like Blue White and Stout that are both at Fury events. Could you explain why these partnerships are so strategic for New Holland and how they contribute to shaping the company's future, maybe? Yes, sure. Um, they, these kind of partnerships, can you hear me? Does it work? Yeah. This kind of partnership is uh, definitely key for us because uh, as an OEM, we maybe do not have the same kind of expertise that, uh, that people like you have. So this gives us uh, the opportunity to access cutting edge innovation. Uh, this helps us to, to be at the fastest uh, speed, uh, let me say, at, uh, in terms of R&D. And to be, because this is a very fast moving market, as you said before. So we want to be ready as well uh, when, the, when the market will be ready. We want to be ready with the most advanced technologies. This is what we try to, to bring with New Holland. Then the other point from more of a strategic uh, point of view, uh, New Holland is a full liner you know, in the ag equipment industry. So if we want to bring the, te the, the technologies to everyone in th this full liner uh, optic, we need to integrate these solutions everywhere we can. So we have that on harvesting, fertilizing, planting, baling, uh, to name a few applications. Um, and so having partnership with, with this kind of, uh, of uh, companies is, is helping us. And then the last point is um, that this helps us to, be, um, to have a better market adoption as well, because those partners might have 
uh, contacts, access network that we can benefit from uh, that are different from our traditional, uh, let me say, database. And uh, this helps us to potential uh, completely our, our uh, approach to this market. Thank you very much, Mary. So you can see that OEMs are more and more involved in agrobotics, in automation, of course, since years. But it's interesting to see how now they are coming also at World Fira to go back to this event and uh, proving kind of that uh, the market is really becoming mature and uh, that at the same time that OEMs or farmers are getting more and more ready to. Regarding World Fira, I wanted to ask you, both of you, Matthias and Jess, You've been involved and, in, well, I have to remind actually the first thing that's really important and maybe you don't know that actually uh, FIRA has been launched first. I think there is a sound problem, no? And the? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the, the, the FIRA has been launched in 2016. So the push of NIO Technologies first, they had this crazy idea of saying, okay, we are like, on a new market, agrobotics doesn't really exist yet. We have to make an event dedicated to the industry. So that's how everything started at World Fira. It was with, with NIO Technologies. And then, well, Fira began quite big enough to fly by itself. So we launched the GoFar Association in 2019 to be independent from any manufacturer and to make sure that we could be neutral and uh, make every manufacturer in the world, uh, well, promote it the way it deserved. So both of you, uh, Jess, AgroIntelli, and uh, Nayo Technologies, you've been involved at FIRA. So how did you see the evolution of the event and uh, why is it, let's say, so important for you as a company to be, to be part of it? Well, uh World Fira, it's for both startups and also for uh, for more mature products. That's and it's uh, I'll say it's everything that's innovative is welcome at uh, at Fira. So for us, it's very important to be there uh, with Roboti because we meet both uh, new distributors. We also meet uh, new customers especially the one who's the first mover and that's where that's the that's the customers we would like to catch also and it is also international not just a local uh, local one and uh, it had, in addition i was uh, 10 uh, 10 days ago as a us fira show and we figured out that uh, the fira just become a, a, corn, a cornerstone for for the uh, events in agricultural um, machine, uh, robotics machinery. And this is key uh, to see that. And I remember when we started eight years ago, I was um, animating a, um, a round table talking about a potential sector with people from Roboti. And uh, we were young companies. Um, there was dealers. There was around the table farmers. And we uh, all agree that in the future, a sector will be created around agrobots, and um, it was the aim of the FIRA when we launched that to say this is not NIO, this is just a matter of uh, having all the people around the table, the manufacturer, the big players as New Holland, obviously, uh, more mature company in agrobots as Roboti or NIO, but also the startups, the newcomers, and this is important to keep uh, the diversity uh, of um, of the sector and. Uh, no, it's clearly uh, become a mature event. We can see uh, a worldwide approach. It was crazy 10, uh, 10 days ago uh, in the US, and it will be amazing uh, in a few months in, uh, in February uh, in Toulouse. Thank you, both of you. Mary, it's a, another kind of question, but always regarding World Shira, how come, I would say, New Holland wanted to be involved more and more uh, with our events. Can you tell us this? Um, well, for New Holland, first of all, going at fairs, even like AMA, is very important. It's an important part of our marketing mix. I don't know if you remember after COVID, 
the industry of fairs, they have really suffered from uh, participation of exhibitors and, and so on, because but we understood that we need to be in contact with our uh, clients and it's not different in this case. So, but why FIRA is specifically interesting for us is that we are, more, we are not a robotic uh, industry, no? so we are exploring this area. And going as such a fair, first of all, it's, uh, it's putting us in the situation to showcase really innovative features. So instead of, uh, so of course we will show our full solution, but we will focus and zoom on this very automa automation feature, for example. And uh, then the other uh, very important point is to, um, to be in contact with customers that are visiting and that are looking for, uh, for this technology uh, because uh, it gives us direct feedback on what we propose. And this is helping us to kind of drive what we want to develop. Uh, without this, we could not, we would be blind somehow. So the interaction with customers is absolutely key. And then, of course, it's, uh, it's about networking as well. No? So meeting uh, startups, companies we don't know to understand what they do, what they present on the market, what are their plans, and perhaps then uh, making agreements, partnership uh, on a longer term. So this is, uh, I believe this will be absolutely key to be at the right pace uh, uh, in terms of robotics and automation. Thank you, Mary. Can you maybe take a few examples of what kind of technology will be presented during FIRA? You have already an idea? Well, uh, I think we will uh, show again uh, the automation features that we have uh, shown at FIRA USA, so uh, with the, um, the solutions of Stout in particular. Blue White is more US, so maybe in the European edition we won't uh, show it too much. So we did not decide this uh, yet in detail. But then uh, we have a lot of automated features on uh, specialty crops. So, for example, there is the LiDAR on the T4. This is a guidance system that uh, makes the tractor go uh, in the lines when the, you have a narrow wine yard. So this is very precise and very uh, efficient. So this is definitely a key point of, uh, of discussion we like to, to show. And we've been very pleased to see uh, that at last edition, people had a genuine interest. They were very curious, very engaged. And this gives us a lot of enthusiasm to go in this direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, well, this is the end of the roundtable. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Yes, th th thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, we so yeah. yes, you, you can, we, we see that those uh, autonomous uh, tractors that are coming up and robots are also coming up in their field. And so how there's a sort of, I suppose there's a sort of gap between tractors and robotics. They don't do exactly the same thing. But uh, at the end, I suppose they're going to they're gonna, uh, have maybe th the same functions. And so what's the gap for the moment between the both? Well, uh, there is the weight. The tractor is a little bit uh, different build. Uh, a robot can also turn on its own. Uh, middle point. So there are different things that a robot can do that a tractor cannot do. So it can operate a little bit different in, uh, in the field than, uh, than a tractor can do. And then there's also the safety. The safety is much higher on a, on a robot than on the tractor autonomous driven at the moment. In addition, in addition, you have to keep in mind something that uh, uh, tractors are regulated by uh, vehicles regulation on road. Most of the robots manufacturers are on machine regulation. It means that off road. So f this is a, a big difference because the rules are quite different. And uh, then it comes about the safety and the autonomy with uh, the different kind of size 
and uh, behavior of the vehicles. And the other topic is regarding the, the climate changing we are facing. There is weather condition more complex, weather windows to, do, um, uh, to go on field. And having robots with uh, um, a lower size, lower weight, less impact on soil, and capacity to run before tractors. And in the same time, you have tractors with more capacities to run fast and to make a uh, higher yield uh, in the same time. So you have two options in, in those situations. Uh, and speaking about agronomy, there is an interest to having both solutions for different tasks, clearly. In the future, uh, what, what we, I don't know the future is, but we can speak of what people are doing right now. We have customers using robots, tractor, and even a donkey in the same time. So it means that you can have a combine of solution, depending on, as a farmer, what you want to do. If soil management is key and strategic, you want to keep a good structure of your soil. You, you don't want to go uh, uh, in a wet condition uh, with a heavy, um, a, a heavy machine. You can have more a profile in having more robots, but you will still remain to have tractors for uh, some key tasks like uh, plowing and uh, all uh, the soil preparation, or even the harvest. So you will have access to difference answer and solution and which is nice is to see the farmer making his own choice regarding what he wants to do in his own farm. Hello, good morning. Uh, Sebastião from Bolsamia. Ande, ande. Hello, good morning. Uh, Sebastião Marques from Bolsamia, Portugal. Uh, can you listen now? Yeah. So, regarding tractors, uh, we've seen them going to, to the fields by the hand of dealers. Um, last year at, at FIRA, uh, we saw a very interesting uh, testimony from a dealer. But except from that, it's not very usual very to, to see dealers speaking about robots. Um, last week at Kubota, uh, we saw that AgroIntelli is, is about to be distributed by Kubota, but it's, from what I understood, through a, a, a team that was founded, that it would be led by Ilgen, that, what, that was at Sticky Tea. And it appeared to me that was a direct distribution strategy. Uh, can we assume that in the future robots will be distributed directly from the brand to the farmer? Or are you counting on dealers? So, we're, we're already now we are distributing two dealers. So we have a we have a dealer network around Europe. This dealer ne network will continue. And uh, of course, when we also get the, the Kubota uh, as a dealer, then it will also be distributed to Kubota. So there'll be more distributors, but it will be the same way of distributing the robot. So from a New Holland point of view, uh, I think the, the ambition is uh, to continue integrating features within the tractors so that the farmer has a really a 360 solution, easy to use, and some, some automation features again are already there and you don't even realize that they are there and you don't even realize that this is somehow robotic. And then when it comes to dealers, of course we need to do a specific effort to train them to be up to speed to this technology that they can explain it in an easy way and help and assist people, uh, farmers, to use it. And uh, in addition, um, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I, I, s I sold directly to end users. I met hundreds of farmers. What I figured out is service is a key. Doesn't matter the color of the robots, service is a key. 
And even we are speaking about autonomous machine. You need to train, as Marie say. You need to provide a service when there, there is an issue. And um, that's why um, working through dealers become a reality. And for us, right now, we got more than 40 dealers in Europe and North America, and we will continue on this way. And obviously, we won't work um, with the classic uh, sales team of a dealer. We work with them in order to, to have a different approach to provide the good service. What's a robot? It can be uh, the robot here from Agro and Tilly or us. The, this is a platform. It can be electrical, uh, can be uh, thermical, doesn't matter. You have a GPS antenna. There is GPS antenna on tractors. There is implements. They are selling and providing services on those implements. So it makes sense to continue this strategy. You can sell directly around, around you. It's easy to provide service. But if you want to have a worldwide expansion, and it's the case for our companies, you need to assume the fact that uh, the dealer network is a key topic for the success. I'm seeing a <clears throat> excuse me. I'm seeing a trend among growers to uh, smaller swarms in drones. Instead of having a helicopter, they'll go to uh, they'll go to multiple drones because. If a helicopter goes down, you're not spraying. If you have multiple drones, one goes down, you're still in business. Less drift. There's a lot of reasons for it. Are any of you working on components that could be swarms within the field with smaller units? So we don't have swarm units, but a few years ago, we were providing services uh, with uh, Oreo, one of our big uh, platform uh, for vegetable in California. And as we talked before, we, due to Kalosha, we were not allowed to have autonomous platform, and we needed to have human beings close to the field. And that's why we started to work um, with having one operator on field and two machines. But we cannot speak that we were providing a real swarm solution. It was just some test to optimize the services we were providing. Currently, uh, it's more what our customer, and we are in specialized corps, are expecting. They are not currently expecting expecting this kind of solution as we are speaking about little farm. We are not speaking about arable crops, huge farm. And in those situations, it can be more useful to have this swarm approach. Hello, good morning, and uh, thank you for this interesting discussion. My name is Johannes Brunner from Neu Technology Park in uh, northern Italy. Um, so I would be interested to know more about so who are the, the first adapters, the innovative uh, farmers which are using first your robots, and maybe who are also the most innovative uh, regions in Europe or also uh, globally who are so investing and uh, so trying out uh, these new technologies. Well, there are three, uh, three first movers. There's the one who's just interested, just need it, just need to buy it. It doesn't matter if you only have 10 hectares, he'll buy it. And then there are the big, uh, the big industry, uh, uh, you can call it uh, industry manufacturers, who has a lot of hectares. Uh, uh, where they are willing to invest in the new technology to see if it's fitting into their, to their needs. And then they're just a farmer who can see that uh, I can use this because I can hire, hire uh, half a man, that's not often, or I can buy a robot. And regarding your question, if, um, if I speak about the innovators, um, the main topic is the fact that they are not ROI driven. When they buy a, a, a robot, it's because they lack new technology or new solution, but in the same time, they are facing a dead end in, in something, like can be a lack of people uh, to help them in the manual weeding, or even a, a backache or a knee ache. And this is something key to pass. And they are not the first one ROI driven. And now we are moving, it's shifting, with more ROI-driven profile. And this is, for me, the big difference between the early adopters 
innovators and now what we are facing. And regarding the markets, Europe have been the first markets with uh, many units. So it's just uh, the fact that you have more company, oldest company like us. So 10 years old, it's kind of dinosaur in the agrobot market. So it just means that uh, uh, just thanks to that, uh, like in France, you have um, two, three, four, five companies providing robots. So this is just one of the reasons that the market is higher in France than in Spain, for example. Uh, in Germany or in Denmark, in Denmark, for example, you have uh, Farmdoid, you have Roboti. So this is a reason that you will see a biggest market. But there's also uh, people who can see it, that there's an advantage by using a robot like the low weight, so you don't destroy the, the soil, and you can get uh, into the field maybe a little bit before that you could do it with a tractor. So there's other perspective also coming into the, to the mind of the one who is starting. And uh, if I can add, so of course we are not selling directly robots, but um, there are also the big farming corporations who have a need to manage big fields and they have a, a need to manage a, a fleet of machines. Um, in particular, again, during harvesting season, during the short window they have, they need to work day and night and they don't necessarily have the operators to work all day long. Uh, so those ones, they, they, are, they really have a need, more than a curiosity or an interest, they have a need to invest in that so that they can make the most uh, out of the harvest. Any other question? Well, so thank you everyone. Thank you Mary, thank you Jess, thank you Matthias. Uh, well, we can stay a little bit in the room if you have other questions one by one afterwards, but uh, I think this is the end of our press conference. Forward Fira, so hope to meet you uh, in February in Toulouse. Uh, there is uh, all the information online. I think you've got the press release from no, my colleague Elisa. Uh, I couldn't give it to you, so if you want our press release, I have it there. So ask me and I will give it to you all. So yeah, the press release is here. We have a press kit that is available on demand, so I uh, will be happy to send it to you. And uh, thank you everyone who Followed everything on live stream and uh, well, see you in February. Thank you.